Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm your host. I'm the cat herder, and I'm the creator of this program. It'll run for the next hour. And this is a conversation-based venue for exploring the future of education. I'm delighted to see so many of you here today. We have two fantastic guests with a great project to share. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome two really, really important writers and thinkers and provocateurs uh, from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, Sean Bain, uh, and she's coming to us as a professor of, I believe, digital education. Uh, and she has an awful lot to share. Hello. Hello. Hi, Brian. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Good to see you. What, what time is it there out in Scotland? Um, it's about 10 past seven in the evening. Beautiful evening in Edinburgh, sun streaming in. Ah, and I know how precious that sun can be. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm so glad to see you. I'm so glad to see you. Uh, you know, there are a lot of ways for academics to be introduced, and uh, I find my favorite way is to ask you what you're going to be working on for the next year. What are the big topics or the big projects that are uppermost in your mind? Um, I think at the moment I'm doing a lot of thinking around the future of higher education teaching post-COVID. So sure. I think all, all the kind of, well, most of the, um, the talk invitations I'm getting are, uh, are people saying, what's going to happen? What have we learned from the last year? And what can we take forward into the future? And what's that going to mean for the shape of our universities and for the way we think about teaching and the way we think about our students? So I think there's a lot of uh, futuring work going on at the moment. Um, and I think it's a great opportunity for, for Jen and I and our co-authors of the manifesto book to kind of start to mobilize some of the thinking in the book to actually map what's coming next. Um, so I think that's that's going to be something we want to do. We also want to do a 2021, 2022 version of the Manifesto for Teaching Online, but maybe we can talk more about that later. We will. We will indeed. Um, that sounds great. Uh, are you going to be teaching this fall? Um, PhDs at the moment. So at the moment, most of my teaching is at the sort of development and leadership. So we're setting up a, a brand new institute in Edinburgh called the Edinburgh Futures Institute, which we're, we're putting a large, a, a really big program of, um, of, of undergraduate and postgraduate education programs kind of into play. So what I'm doing at the moment, all my, most of my teaching time is, 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 about, is around directing that piece of work and leading it and trying to understand what a really forward looking, exciting kind of interdisciplinary curriculum could, can look like for a, a futures institute with quite big ambitions. So, so that's what I'll be doing in the teaching sphere over the next year. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> Well, hold on one second. Let me just um, add to our deck uh, one of uh, Sean's colleagues. Uh, this is Jen Ross, also from the University of Edinburgh. And let me bring her up. On the Hello, Jen. Hello. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Good. I'm not on the sunny side of my house. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's this okay. is the it's cloudy. Still, it's, nice. it's the dour and lowering side. Oh, I see. <laughs> Well, let me ask you, Jen, what are you going to be working on for the next year? Um, one of the big projects I have on the go at the moment uh, is a book, actually, which is trying to pull together some of the work that I've done with Shan and other colleagues uh, over the last 10 years or so, developing and implementing and using um, speculative methods for digital education research and also for digital education teaching. Um, so I... Um, in the midst of writing that now, and uh, it is taking up a lot of my headspace, but in a good way. Um, and I'm just, yeah, really excited to think about some of those issues today with everybody. Well, that sounds like a fantastic book. I would love to hear more about that um, later on. Well, I would love to talk about it. <laughs> oh, good, good. I mean, you're still writing it. Good. Yes. <laughs> well, friends, if, if um, well, first of all, welcome both to Jen and, and Shan. Uh, you two are here to talk about a great project you've worked on, along with other folks, and this goes back somehow 10 years. Uh, so in 2011, you two helped put out the Manifesto for Teaching Online. In 2016, you revised it to add even more stuff and to, well, we'll learn more why. And then just this year, you're publishing it in book form. So it's kind of the third edition of this. Along the way, there have been videos, there have been PDF versions. And now Sean has already been hinting at us that there may be a next post-COVID edition of this. 
So, uh, for, if you're if you're new to the uh, to the manifesto, in the bottom left corner of your screen, you should see a big kind of tan or mustard colored uh, button. And if you click that, that will take you to the MIT Press site, so you can you know grab a copy for yourself. Grab two for a friend as well. But I, there's so much in that, and the manifesto is so brilliant at getting people to think more interestingly and with more nuance about teaching online. Um, and I have questions at every point of it. But the first thing I just wanted to ask to start off with was, how has it changed over 10 years? Well, how is your thinking about all of this change? Uh, you, you, I can see some of the added points and a few word choice changes, but, but tell us more about how this has changed as it sailed through the sea of years for 10 years. Do you want to go first, Jen, or shall I? Um, um, you go first, Jen. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, it's funny because I was thinking about that exact same question just before we came online and I was looking back again at the 2011 manifesto and some of it just does seem really quite old fashioned now. There was a big focus on um, on, on what, what I2I I might mean in the context of an internet that, that wasn't generally kind of high bandwidth. You know, we, it was before we'd had this kind of FaceTime revolution, if you like, in digital education. But at that time, most of our online teaching was in uh, text-based discussion forums and things like that. So I think that was a big a big shift from 2011 to the 2016 edition where we, we were, so in, in 2011, we were trying to sort of make the case for how rich digital education could be without necessarily having to be dependent and reliant on FaceTime. Um, and then all those, all those things kicked off, you know, Web2 and the Read Write Web and kind of social media all kicked off in that space sort of between 2011 and 2016. And suddenly we were writing about quite a different internet, a much more high bandwidth experience, much more video oriented experience. Um, so I think there, were, there have been big technological changes and since 2016 there have been even more, but we can talk about those later. So technology is huge. Yeah, so technology mm -hmm. has been developed and is immense. Jen, what would you add? Um, I think that there's been in the time since the first manifesto, a real shift in the kinds of conversations that go on about digital education amongst educators in general. So there are always people having the kinds of critical conversations about education and technology that um, is, are reflected in the manifesto. But I think we're just seeing over the, over the years since then, much more sensitivity on the part of educators in general, students, institutions, to some of the risks and the issues mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the problems um, that can come along with the kind of uncritical use of technology in education. So, um, I mean, obviously it's hard to think beyond the last year that we've just had because it's been so pivotal in so many ways, but I would, I would say the kind of interest in and awareness of issues around surveillance, for example, has really ramped up in the last few years. Um, so it feels to me, I don't know, Sean, what you think, but it feels like we're having conversations now that are actually some, somewhat, we're still trying to find ways of talking in, in positive and um, open and optimistic ways about technology and education because I think all of us still really believe in the possibilities um, but at the same time I think we've all found people very open to those more critical conversations as well which has been very interesting students as well yeah no I agree with that Jen because I think the internet has become much less fun <laughs> since 2011 when we first wrote the manifesto you know we've moved I think in educational technology from this idea that um, you know, teaching online was a kind of a, a kind of open, free territory where things could work differently and things mm -hmm. could be just freer. Into now, you know, edtech as a market which is driving and in many instances reshaping edu higher education teaching, and and that opens up all the things that Jen has, has hinted at: the surveillance cultures, the kind of um, the, the architectures of instrumentalization, and all the rest of it. And so it is much. It's it's a much less kind of. Oh, it feels like it's less full of promise and it's more full of problems. And I think that is kind of partly what has kicked off what was Jen talking about, these more critical conversations and a recognition that we need to be having those conversations as educators. Thank you very much. Um, both the huge technological piece of change as well as these, the shift in our conversations around this, Jen. 
Well, I'd, I'd say your 2011 manifesto does a good job of setting up both. Uh, you have this really quiet line, a routine of plagiarism detection structured in the relation of distrust. Sounds like last year, right away. We feel we feel pretty good about that one. I, I think you should. And, uh, and, and your point about open, that open is based on closed. Uh, again, I, I think these are very good provocations towards criticism. But before I say anything more, let me just say, Friends, I'm the, I'm the moderator, I'm the MC here. The place for questions is yours. Uh, everyone in the, uh, in the participant swarm, this is your chance to raise questions, ask more clarifications, to raise triumphant shouts of support, and to also flag criticism and disagreement. Uh, the place is completely yours. Uh, and to begin, with, oh, by the way, in the chat, uh, there was a plea for fellow Canadians. And I just wanted to say uh, hello, welcome to Mathieu Plourde who is also here from the, I think, Université Laval. Uh, so the first question that's already come in is from David Poole at National University. We just put his question on the screen. Curious as to what some of the equity and access challenges that students in Edinburgh had faced during 2020, 2021. Perhaps they mirror the challenges here in the US, perhaps they're different. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they're pretty similar. I mean, I think for Edinburgh, it's been a combination of um, students feeling incredibly frustrated by the digital pivot, either because they don't have um, the skills or their teachers don't have the skills to kind of set uh, to kind of um, deliver the kind of online teaching that they, that they want, or because they don't have access to the technologies that they need to do it. So there's been that, or they're just frustrated by not being able to be on campus, right? Because higher education is very campus centric. And I think those, you know, over the last year, people have really had to kind of move away from that. So there's been that kind of body of students that have had a, a, a poor experience and a frustrating experience. And then there's the body of students on the other side who have just really benefited from it. So I was looking, I was reading today um, an account from a student with a disability who was just saying, you know, that the digital pivot and the hybrid, the shift to hybrid teaching has been absolutely brilliant for me. It's kind of freed up my life. I, could, I don't have to come to campus to see my, my, um, my teacher and so on. So I, I think it's a very mixed bag and I, I bet it's pretty similar to what, to what you're seeing over there. One of the things that I've been really happy to see um, in the UK in general and the University of Edinburgh in particular, I guess, as the context that I know the best, is that um, the universities seem to have understood something of what this experience of crisis has been like for students. Um, and I, I have seen a lot, you know, just in my capacity as a teacher this year, a lot of kind of materials flowing through my email inbox that have been, you know, reminding us as teachers to be sensitive to students. But also, you know, a lot of policies have kind of shifted in favor of more flexibility for students and more kind of... Um, understanding of the of the issues that people are facing and as someone who's always taught sort of mature students I guess or you know mid-career professionals you know we've we've always wanted that kind of sensitivity to the kind of lives of, of students and it's really been good to see that and I don't know how much that's been echoed in what's been happening um, in other countries but I would be really interested to know whether other people have seen something like that. Um. Just, you know, I, I think we've experienced that both uh, here on the forum in our discussions over the past year. Uh, and I've heard this from quite a few people. Jen, I, I'm wondering if uh, you have two different speakers going, because we're getting a little bit of an echo from you. Hmm. Um, so I don't know if you're getting uh, earbuds and uh, inbuilt mic. Just think of taking it. Um, Let me check it out, but I'll put myself on mute while I'm not talking. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a great question. Um, and I want to thank uh, uh, David for asking it. And I want to thank Jen for and and uh, Sean for a very, very sensitive answer. Uh, again, if you're new, this is an example of a text question. Uh, just uh, David, just click the question mark button, type it in, and we flashed out the screen for everyone to see. Um, that you can just enter anything you like in that uh, question and answer box. And you can also click the raised hand if you'd like to join us on stage, um, really deepening this transatlantic conversation. And while people are thinking, and their brains are going further, uh, Mathieu Pleur noticed in the uh, chat, he was so naive. I wish I could tell my 2011 self to prepare for real bummer. <laughs> Uh, Rebecca Jones, a the tech industry, is driving experience. 
And then there's some interesting company asks, are there some ed tech companies who are much more attuned to the realities and requirements of learners and teachers? That's a good question. Uh, Sean, uh, uh, Jen, any, any names you want to throw out? No. <laughs> not really. I, not that I, I, I don't. I don't. I'm, I'm sure there are companies out there. I don't know. I don't know who they are. Actually, it would be really great if there are if there are colleagues in the in the room today who do have um, kind of networks within kind of industry where 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 these conversations are happening. Because in my experience, the kinds of conversations that we're having within universities and that we're flagging in the manifesto aren't necessarily happening in industry contexts. And part of that is about us and us getting better at having a, a kind of raising those conversations and working with colleagues in industry to, to to connect um but and part of it i guess is about industry reaching out to education researchers and those of us doing critical research in this area to to have those conversations but yeah no i'd, I'd be very grateful to learn from this group about that to be honest um thank you uh i hope we can find some more and if anyone wants to throw any in the chat please uh please feel free uh, I'm sure you troubleshoot the uh, echo at the same time. Um, so I'm actually going to switch my own sound output to a different device and see if that makes a difference. Let's see. Can you still hear me? Whoa. Yeah. Doesn't, that seems to have maintained the problem. Uh, I'm still getting echo from there. Uh, Rebecca follows up and asks, none of these companies are involving researchers. Uh, apparently not. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, some are. I know the big, tech, of course, the tech, the big tech companies have have researchers and have, um, you know, social scientists as well as um, computing scientists and all the rest. But I, I'm honestly not aware of which companies are having the in-depth conversations. You know, which of the ed tech companies are having the big conversations about what we might, what might be wrong with educational technology and how we might fix it. I'm not. I'm not aware. But again, it's not. It's not. Um, it's not really a field that I have done much research in at the moment. So, it would be good to know more. You back, Jim? Maybe. Maybe. You are. <laughs> okay. Um, now we have other questions that uh, have come up, um, and we've had questions that came in by email uh, before as well. You know, questions that have to do with the content of the manifesto, as well as uh, how it's changed. One of the problems that I admire most about it is this idea that place doesn't matter in terms of opposed place to online. That basically virtual and physical are different modalities, and that there are many, many different ways of thinking through that. Now, I'm curious if you've gotten um, any kind of uh, pushback from that, or if this is something which really has proven to be a strong point of the manifesto. Jen, you <laughs> well, I, I, I'm not sure this is an exact response to this question, so please, if, if whoever asked that is in, uh, let us know if you want us to say more. But I, I think um, actually the the reason why one of the main reasons why this manifesto was written in the first place was because we were in our roles as researchers and teachers and colleagues getting lots of pushback on some of the things that we were pr presenting as kind of a fundamentally good way of thinking about digital education and in fact that first statement in the manifesto which is that online can be a privileged mode has always been very controversial um and it it's it's oh it's remained i can't imagine it disappearing in the next um iteration of the manifesto either actually because it is the foundational kind of idea behind the work that we've been doing in this manifesto and in this book um the idea that distance is a positive principle and not a deficit um is is actually hugely discussion provoking usually um and so these questions about you know space being different rather than worse if you're thinking about working virtually or working at a distance. Um, they, we do, I still do have conversations with people who are 
we'll kind of agree that that's probably right, but still those assumptions come through when you talk to people about, you know, well, you would you could do that if you couldn't manage to get everybody together in the room. And honestly, I don't think the last year of pandemic teaching has helped that tendency to see that as the kind of second best alternative because, you know, we were all, many people were just thrust into this way of teaching um, and learning without really choosing it or particularly wanting it. And I think it, it's, it, it was seen as a kind of emergency response rather than something you might choose and design for. Um, and I think we might see some unfortunate impacts from that um, in the next few years as we all sort of deal with the shake out of this. I understand. Yeah. Oh, please go ahead, Sean. Oh, sorry, thanks. Um, yeah, and I think that's right, Jen, and I think it connects to actually what's my probably my fav favourite point in the manifesto, which is when we say, um, don't succumb to campus envy, we are the campus. Um, you know, the, because I think that that really came out of, you know, a, a programme of research that we've been doing into what place and space means to students who are studying entirely online. Um, and we found in that research that there was this sense among students that um, what we ended up calling campus envy, this idea that however good a time you're having in your online class, there was this sort of nagging sense that if you had been on campus or in the physical university, somehow it would have been even better. Um, and, and that it, it often that that isn't true in fact often our students have a better time sort of studying online they get a d different kind of um experience but often when they compare it they see it as being better than what they had on when they were studying on campus so we coined this phrase campus envy to try to encapsulate that idea that people see the campus as being this kind of touchstone of authentic academic experience um and, and, in, and in that sense, they kind of internalize this idea that to be online is to be in a sec second best, that online is second best. Um, online teaching will never be as good as on-campus teaching. And that's that's the, been a theme across both, as Jen says, across both manifestos, and one that I think we'll want to extend into the next one as well, because it's absolutely critical. I think, I mean, our university is, I don't know, 500 years old. It has a 500 year history of, of, of campus centrism and um, kind of fetishization of the campus in the sense that to be a student is to be on campus. And that's going to, that takes a lot of pushing back on and a lot of rethinking. It, it does. And that's a great concept. I love the idea of canvas envy. Uh, campus envy. Uh, <laughs> follow up from uh, Marath, who um, uh, asks Doesn't this depend on where in life you are? And I'm wondering if you wanted to grab that. Maybe, Jen, since you talked about teaching adult learners. Um, sorry, my, my connection dipped out. So what's the, what does what depend on sure. where in life? Um, Marath asked a question in terms of campus envy. Oh, uh, campus envy, yeah. Um, doesn't it depend on where in life you are? I think that is absolutely must be the case yes um, and i think we do understand higher education at the undergraduate level as being about much more than um the the academic even the academic networking and the academic um socializing it has a kind of meaning for us that goes way beyond that um in 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 the uk and the us and other places i think as well um and so I think the, the trouble that we have is if we want to start to think about education as something more flexible and um, possible to be engaged with from more places in more kinds of ways, then we also simultaneously have to think about what that means for the the kind of, I don't know, the process of kind of coming of age, I guess, for young people. Um, if we're not able to say we're going to, you know, Put everybody together on a campus for four years um, or three years and this is you know this is a kind of formative experience in your life what 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 does it begin to look like and I think that's an interesting and nice challenge to have in a way but it depends if we just ditch the stuff and then yeah you know don't find ways of other sorts of coming of age spaces and places for people well, that's a really good point. Jen, if, if you want to mute yourself for a second, I want to test something out. Um, yeah, it might be that we're getting a, a feedback loop from that. Uh, but this is a crucial point. Uh, now we're still getting a little bit of echo. Uh, let's see if this makes a difference. Oh, my gosh. That did it. That did it. 
We can think of this as the Edinburgh double echo uh, that we just had. Um, Jen's point was crucial, I think, about traditional age students, which is where Maria's point really comes in handy, you know, where you are in life. A couple of comments have come up that are observations that build on this. Uh, I want to make sure that we can see this. One came in from uh, Abby Johnson. Uh, I see campus envy a lot, especially with faculty who teach both. I know faculty who deliberately try to make their online courses worse to be competitive with the on-ground version. Oh, it's just horrifying. Uh, Abby, thank you for that. Uh, and uh, also in the, uh, in the chat, Mathieu observes, the campus was never all that. All teaching happened in the void of the classroom, never to be seen or assessed by peers. Um, so I, I think we're doing a good job of deconstructing the, uh, the centrality of the campus there. Um, but we also have um, uh, another question that takes us from a different angle. And I wanna make sure that you guys get a chance to wrangle this one. And this continues our transatlantic theme, by the way, bringing in the South Atlantic, because we have a question from South Africa. Uh, this is from uh, Sukena, who asks, in the manifesto, you mentioned the central role of the online teacher. Can you talk about that in the context of the online being the privileged mode? Dan, do you want to talk about facilitation? Ah, yes. Um, well, I wasn't, yeah, no, you talk about facilitation. I'll, <laughs> I'll talk, okay. I think I, I can talk about the, uh, the why we focused the manifesto on the idea of the online teacher because we did get quite a lot of flack actually when we first wrote the manifesto because we called it the manifesto for teaching online and lots of people said why is why haven't you called it the manifesto for learning online because this is supposed to be all about you know all about learners um and actually we we did push back really hard on that because we specifically wanted this manifesto to be about the art and the craft of teaching and about the responsibilities of the teacher to um in their professional work um because i think uh you know, one kind of quite worrying trend, I guess, in educational technology is to see the kind of deprofessionalization of the teacher and the replacement of certain parts of the teaching function by technology. Um, and we wanted to really push back against that, you know, that, you know, there, there's a, loads, of, loads of things that are positive about the kind of shift over the last decade into talking about student-centered learning and putting the student at the center of the educational experience. But actually, we still have to take responsibility for, for what it means for our students to learn as teachers and we still have to value teachers as professionals um so, so that was why we called it manifesto for, for teaching online it is about it's about teaching it's not about learning um but that's a different issue from the facilitation one jen that i'll hand back i'll hand back to you for that one if you like thanks yeah the, the question made me think about um these conversations and i actually this was um, this was happening even at the time of the first manifesto where people were um, really excited about the shift to online education because they precisely saw some kind of like erasure of power dynamics between teachers and students and that this could be a much kind of flatter um, space where, you know, teachers wouldn't be teachers, they would be facilitators or guides and maybe people didn't need teachers at all and they could teach themselves and each other and all all of this stuff, um, which has now been actually greatly, um, greatly enhanced and exacerbated by discussions about like the te the technology as the teacher, um, but that's come in maybe a little more in the last few years. Um, all of these things, I think, are just super problematic in terms of thinking about the kind of power that, at least in formal educational settings like universities, um, that the teacher and the institution have and and as Shan says the responsibilities that come alongside that and it's not that there are not other models of teaching that can be um interestingly explored but the idea that we can say that the, you know the kind of that the responsibilities and the choices are nothing to do with us and that we're just facilitators and other people are leading their own learning um is i think not a good direction for um mm. us to be taking in universities there's almost a, a labor argument about this that this is really um you know centering the professional work and status of the instructor um uh, I'm using the term instructor as a kind of baseline, uh, a neutral term here. Um, that's oh, a, yeah, that's a, I think that's, a, is it okay to come in there, Brian? Because I think that's absolutely right. And um, the precarity of labor issue is a really vital one here. And I think for me, 
if, if there's if there is any part of the manifesto that I, I've had some I currently have some doubts about it's the, it's the bit where we say um, um, that we welcome our robot colleagues we say automation need not impoverish education we welcome our robot colleagues and the reason we said that is because we didn't we don't want to get into a position where there's kind of you know the, automation bad human teacher good because that doesn't help us think creatively about technological change and what we as teachers can do um, positively with automation um, but it does kind of it, it does kind of sometimes shock people I think because it, it, I think when we redevelop the manifesto we, we need to nuance that idea a little bit because we need to recognize the connection of automation to academic precarity and the connection of automation to the kind of routinization and degrading and deprofessionalization um, of higher education teaching that we're seeing. So I think there are quite a few issues there to unpick. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's uh, Sukena, what a fantastic question. Um, and uh, I'm really, really, really glad that, uh, that you picked that one out. And that just shows, I think, the strength of these manifestos over time um, is just how deeply they go. Uh, we have um, another question that's coming in. Questions are now becoming uh, coming in like uh, like the wind. Uh, and this is one from Rocky at uh, Messiah University. Um, and she asks, in my online classes, I have a big focus on students as digital content creators, creative commons, etc. I'd love to hear more about your statement. Remixing digital content redefines authorship. That could be any of you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, thanks, because I think that's exactly the kind of teaching practice that sparked some of the thoughts and the research that led to this particular manifesto point. Um, we spent, um, we've spent many years uh, on teaching on our MSc in digital education program trying to um, work with different kinds of representations of knowledge. So we've always invited students to produce digital essays, to produce multimodal work, um, to produce creative things that they can um, do with, with digital spaces and digital tools. Um, and that's all been really positive actually. And um, I'm, it's one of the things that I, I think I and lots of colleagues are the most proud of in terms of the kinds of work that get produced through that approach and through um, that program. But it also asks us as teachers and people assessing this work and students as they're putting it together um, to ask some hard questions about whose work this is, um, especially when, for example, students are using um, the kinds of really good, interesting tools that allow people to sort of create um, animations or other things with like a bank of existing materials that they that they kind of remix and put together um, or where people are bringing in sort of sound or images that they didn't create directly. Um, looking at remix and assessing remix um, does ask us to think differently about authorship and um, one, one of our colleagues, James Lamb, has done a lot of really interesting work just exploring these kinds of issues about remix and assessment and authorship um, that have, have kind of inspired some, some of our thinking around this. Just, just quickly, if, if you have anything you want to throw into the chat from James Lamb, please feel free to, and I can share it through Twitter and so on. Go ahead, Shan. I, I think it's, yeah, I, I think also this is part of a kind of bigger program or project of assessment or, or grading reform, isn't it? Because uh, assessment kind of protocols, at least in our university and in much of the UK have historically and traditionally, at least in humanities and social science, has been kind of focused on the written essay, the single stable text that's produced by the individual author. Um, and, and so sort of coming at this, I suppose, via a sort of post-structuralist kind of death of the author sort of perspective, which is kind of what framed that original um, manifesto point, we need to understand how, how do new modes of, of writing, how do new modes of content creation and content sharing and remix shift the, you know, the fundamental and underpinning idea of the author and the idea of the individual student um, as the as the kind of um, unit by which we judge academic attainment, and actually try and think a bit differently about that. Think about kind of how how remix um, brings in different kinds of literacies and different kind of writing abilities and competencies and di a different kind of 
um, working across networks, which in itself is is really valuable and is really important intellectual work, but that as as conventional universities, we haven't historically been that very particularly good at taking account of. So I think it's a bigger program uh, of reform as well. Oh, interesting. Again, once again, this manifesto dives deeply and deeply. Um, and uh, Rocky, thank you for that great question. Um, and of course, I'm really glad for your students having the benefit of that approach. Uh, and I love how this the, your answer managed to work through uh, the uh, long history of textual death of the author from Barth and Foucault all the way up through the practice of, of how to teach right now. Uh, we have more questions coming in and uh, friends, if you would like to ask a video question, again, just please click the raise hand button and, and you can do that. Uh, this is a question from uh, question. Uh, the labor question I come up against often as an instructional designer that teaching online well is a huge undertaking, and many institutions pay adjuncts well. In the U.S. situation, adjunct is a faculty member who is taught, uh, who is paid part time for individual classes. They're not full time uh, uh, members of the staff. Um, do you want to speak to that question of the labor of teaching online? Um, yeah, so we, 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 when we, we wrote the manifesto from the kind of um, perspective of our um, our own master's or um, graduate program in digital education, and oh. that program is quite unusual in that it, we don't really use adjuncts particularly. So every every course or every module or every unit on that program is led by you know pretty much by an academic member of staff um, who's who's teaching from a research based perspective, um, and. Absolutely, the labor is immense, but we were lucky in that sense in that with that particular program we had, and we were able to to run that program without a lot of adjunct kind of input. We, you know, we've always managed to keep student numbers low enough that we can kind of give students that quality of experience and we can lead um, as academics. But I mean, you're absolutely right that there's a real strong kind of um, trajectory here that, you know, that we, we front load development of online teaching and then we leave adjuncts and poorly play, paid precarious um, people on precarious contracts to kind of do the grunt work of um, moderation and assessment and, and so on. And I think that's a really worrying um, trajectory and something that, again, we need to push, we need to be pushing back hard on. Jen, I'll let you come. Oh, sorry, I lost my connection again, but I've tried a different browser now, so I think we're good. You sound great. Oh, perfect. Better than before. Yes. Oh, all right. Chrome it is. Um, mm -hmm. Was this a question about precarity and academic labor? Well, uh, precarity, yes. Uh, in, and, and it came right out of the U.S. settings. So we're talking about adjuncts, but also the question that teaching well online is a huge undertaking, and it can mm -hmm. often take more time than to teach face-to-face. Yeah, this is funny. And this is a conversation I've been having a lot um, in the last year, as you can imagine, um, because I think that uh, one of the things that is, is, is the case is that once you've done something once, it becomes possible to build on that the next time right. Right. with a, you know, in an online course in a way that maybe isn't so visible and apparent the first time you do it when it's just a massive amount of work to put something together. One of the things I'm a bit worried about is, you know, people have put an unprecedentedly huge amount of work into um, putting courses online in the last year. And if we are rushing straight back to the classroom and face-to-face -face teaching as soon as possible, people might miss some of the opportunities for reusing, remixing, building on materials. Um, that is actually one of the nicest things about the amount of work that goes into the pre-preparing of materials. Um, so I'm kind of I'm kind of worried that people won't won't actually get that good experience of being able to say oh okay this week from last year was still pretty good I'm going to keep this one and I can just you know make a little tweak to this one and that will be great as well and I don't know it's it's I don't I think it remains to be seen but I am seeing people sort of really keen to get away from the amount of work that it was without realizing that actually that work is more significant the first time you do it it really is a classic hump you have to get over the first time and then in theory you know it gets easier with every subsequent iteration 
Th thank you, Jen, for multitasking brilliantly and sharing <laughs> that link. Uh, here, let me, I just put this in the chat. And in fact, I'll just flash it for everyone to see here. This is a uh, link to your colleague, James Lamb, about uh, uh, remixing uh, digital authorship. So if you want to grab that, uh, that looks really tasty. <laughs> um, thank you uh, again for, uh, for that really, really good answer. This is, Abby, you hit upon a major, major topic. And if you're new to the forum, by the way, going back, we've been addressing academic labor since the beginning. Uh, so there are many discussions about this. We have several um, uh, futures questions, and uh, I'll begin with one of them from Betsy Kells at, uh, at the Penn Language Center. And Betsy asks, regarding best practices, can something like universal design for learning ignore context or perhaps cultural context? Interesting. <laughs> Sorry, Jen. I, honestly, I don't think universal design for learning is a, a kind of concept that's particularly known in the UK. Am I wrong, Jen? I mean, this isn't a, a framework that I'm particularly familiar with. It would be. No, I would. I would say I've seen more of that in the kind of literature around, um, like, online course design, and I think this is about um, designing for as as kind of wider. Uh, a range of users as possible. Am I right about that, Brian? You're nodding, so I think I am. Yeah, and I just put a, a link in the chat. Um, this, this is aimed in part at physical accessibility. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you design for disability, for example? Um, and UDL is very, very powerful stuff. Yeah, and the, and the question was, I think, whether we have to um, think about that in the context of the manifesto statement that's about um, context and best practice. Um, that's a really great question. <laughs> I, I, would like, I would like someone else to answer it. Um, I think, yeah, I, I, I think that's a really great question. Betsy, um, to ponder that. maybe what we should do, Betsy, is we should circle back to that question in a future session um, and just get some folks um, who specialize in UDL um, and, and have them tackle it. Because I think that's a, a really, really good question. Uh, we have a, a few more questions, and I'm afraid we're, we're starting to run in the last 10 minutes. So I want to make sure that you get a chance, everybody, to, uh, to uh, ask your, your, to say your piece, as we say. Uh, so here's a question from uh, Mathieu Plurnt, who asks, how do we make ourselves valuable so robots remain colleagues and not overlords? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I think we, we need to just continue to value our own work and value ourselves. You know, I think there's a lot of, um, I don't know, when I do kind of uh, scoping of the, of, of the kind of dominant kind of language that's used in some of the educational technology sort of policy and industry and think pieces, mm -hmm. so much yeah. of it is about, you know, now that, you know, crudely, now everything's available online. Um, teachers are going to teachers are being re reduced to coaches and mentors, and artificial intelligence is going to do the real teaching for us. Um, there's, this is a really dominant discourse in the um, in the field at the moment, and I think it's for us as partly as individual academics and teachers and educators, but also as um, institutions, just to get better at telling really compelling stories about what we want the future of higher education to look like and what we want the future of higher education teaching to look like and why we need to play, put, put the professional teacher at the centre of that future and not allow um, technology to be kind of um, to be leveraged in to take that kind of you know that this kind of solutionism that we're seeing constantly in the sector that technology is providing a solution to all the problems that we're seeing within education without those problems ever really being defined so we're seeing a really worrying discourse where higher education teaching is constantly in deficit mode without that the nature of that deficit ever being explicitly explained to us but the kind of loose promise of technology coming in to make it all better. And I think that part of this is about, and I think this connects to the work that Jen is doing around speculation and speculative futures. Mm -hmm. It's about developing really compelling stories about the future, which, which value um, what we do as teachers and what the teaching profession um, does, but 
Jen, I know you'll have more to say about that from the perspective would, of the book. I would have more to say about speculation, but I think also um, one other kind of answer to that question is that I think we can usefully push back against the tendency to see different parts of the academic role as separable from each other. So the one, the, one of the things that I find particularly troubling is the um, increasing push to see things like um, requesting extensions, for example, as something that could be taken away from the kind of teacher and give them less to do while, you know, giving it to, uh, you know, a central admin spot or automating it in some way. Um, I think we also see this in relation to some extent to kind of pastoral student support where, you know, it's thought to be that maybe that work should be done by the student support team rather than by the teacher. And yeah. all of those things um, seem to me to be damaging the relationships between students and teachers that I would consider to be kind of at the heart of what we're trying to do in higher education. And I think we don't actually know what the impact of a student building the kind of relationship with a teacher where they can ask them for an extension, what impact that has on being able to have bigger conversations with the teacher about other things that might seem more academic in nature. Um, and so I think the solution to um, the kind of crisis of overwork and labor issues in, the hi in higher education is not to push for more unbundling of services, um, but to think differently about, you know, staff student ratios. And, you know, these are the kinds of things that I think might help us kind of maintain the um, the importance and relevance of our role and be better for students and for the kind of relationships of higher education. Wow, that was a small manifesto by itself. <laughs> Great. I have opinions about this, Brian. Which is why we're so glad to have you here. Um, <laughs> and, and also, I like how you how you kind of pointed back towards the centrality of the instructor again hmm. um, in doing so. Oh, that was that was terrific. What a great question. Uh, thank you uh, again for doing that. And thank you both for, for going so far with that. In the chat, while these two are, are, are thinking so thoughtfully about this, we also have a whole series of follow-ups on the Universal Design for Learning questions. Uh, Ed Webb, a, a British expatriate now trapped in Pennsylvania, uh, mentioned that his unusually non-digitally online uh, college did a lot of UDL on their pivot online during the pandemic. George Station uh, asks about cultural competence and then suggests a couple of books about UDL and uh, equity slash anti-racism. Um, uh, Rocky has a really, really good points about cognitive ability, uh, cultural diversity, language. Uh, so a lot of good discussions uh, coming there. And then Rocky also suggests uh, Andra Tesha Fitzgerald's book. Um, mm -hmm. So um, uh, Rocky, if, uh, if um, Maybe she'd be a good guest for us to have on the forum. Uh, while we're thinking about that angle of the future, Roxanne Riskin asked another question that cuts us into a different angle, which is, in your manifesto, I'm curious if you found any connections with environmental benefits, like carbon footprint reduction or more environmental awareness with online teaching. Yeah, it, we um, in the in the book, the, the conclusion to the book sort of outlines some of the areas that that we need to cover in the next manifesto, and climate change was very much one of those. Um, oh, what a gorgeous cat! She's enormous. <laughs> <laughs> The cutie. Um, yeah, climate change was, was a, a, an absolutely key one because we didn't in the 2016 manifesto, and I feel bad about this, we didn't reference or talk about the impact um, of digital on climate crisis at all. And we do need to address that because we, we, we now know the immense kind of impact of teaching online and the production of our devices, the emissions and the, the environmental um, burden that server farms kind of bring. And uh, uh, we haven't really had those discussions. I know we're increasingly having them now within within the community, um, but I think we've been quite slow to come to this. Well, we certainly have at, at Edinburgh, and there's an immense amount of work to do on that. And it's, it, it is a problematic one for us. I mean, Jen and I are currently thinking of ways to design education so we minimize the need for students to travel, for example, by using digital creatively, but then that doesn't really help us deal with the issue of dependence on um, on cloud services and so forth. So there's a lot to unpick. It's a really good question. 
Yeah, I'm just I'm so glad that you said it in that way, Shan, because I think the immediate thought is, well, digital is better for the environment. And yes, I mean, there are some arguments that to be made about that for sure. Um, but I think as digital educators, we do really need to think a lot about the the um, nuances of that issue and not just say, well, we're, you know, we're better than some some ways of teaching because um, it's it requires a lot more um, thought, as Shan says. Oh, great question. And thank you both for opening that into new directions, um, especially as I write my book on climate change and higher ed. Um, I appreciate all of that. Mm. Uh, we have um, one last question, um, and they're just skating in just under the radar. Uh, and this is one that's been asked by a few different people. So I'll put one of them up on the screen from uh, Benjamin Rifkin at Hofstra, who asks, the experience of teaching online during the pandemic should not be allowed to lay fallow. What do you think are the most important lessons learned that all instructors should reflect on in face-to-face? -face. That's a good summative question. Um, I have one answer. I'm sure Jen will have um, others. For me, it's about what have we learned about mo mobility over the last year? Um, so a lot of the work that we've done in our research program has been around using mobility theory to understand um, kind of the, the, the nature of, of movement and the nature of how we kind of historically have tended to privilege sedentarism and campus over distance and the ability to be free of campus and to move around. And I think over the last year, we've learned to value, we, we've learned to kind of long for the ability to move again and to travel again. Um, but we've also learned to value the ability to stay in one place and to be at home and to start. And, and I think there are lessons from that to take into the post pandemic era in the way that we design our teaching for students to recognize that students increasingly are going to want that that freedom to move about when they need to move about and to to stay still when they need to move still and that that presents some really big issues for campus centrism and the tendency in most yeah. universities to require students to come to campus and the relationship between online distance learning and on-campus learning so for me that's a really exciting kind of thing to be grappling with over the next few years do you think that, just, just really quickly, do you think that the pandemic will have done a, a massive blow to campus envy? <laughs> I mean, it definitely has been the case that ideas about kind of contact have radically changed in the last year, right? Like we just have seen the hugest shift in understandings of, um, you know, distance when we think about social distance now as a kind of safety, as a way of um, expressing care and trust. Um, it's, a, it's a really weird situation. It's interesting. It is. It is. Jen, did you want to add anything else in terms of what we should take away from the pandemic? Yeah, I think that um, coming back to the point about surveillance, actually, um, I, I think we are at a very pivotal moment for education generally in relation to um, surveillance and monitoring and um, privacy. And the pandemic really exacerbated a lot of trends towards um, towards the, all of those things, um, towards more monitoring, towards surveillance, towards remote proc proctoring and all kinds of things that I think we, we as a community of teachers tend to find a bit problematic, even though um, we use them. Um, so I think actually yeah. it's more of a question than a statement about the future um, based on the pandemic. It's just, I'm really interested in what kind of direction we will be able to push these questions about surveillance and privacy um, in the coming years, given that I think we've lost some ground this year um, as a result of a lot of decisions being made quickly. Um, yeah, I would, I would, I'm gonna be paying a lot of attention to that. So surveillance and privacy on the one hand and mobility on the other. Two fantastic uh, answers to end up a whole series of fantastic answers. Thank you both, uh, Shan and Jen, for being a superb guests today. I'm, I'm really delighted that you could have joined us, and I love that we're able to learn so much from all of you. Uh, let me just quickly ask, what's the best way for folks to keep up with you, besides obviously buying your book, several copies? Uh, <laughs> what are the best ways to follow your current thought on this? Um, we're both pretty active on Twitter, aren't we? Again, I'll, I'll put our um, I'll put our Twitter um, usernames up. Um, it would be great to connect with colleagues here on Twitter at some point. Yeah, that would be great. The other thing is um, the website of the Centre for Research and Digital Education always has all the latest um, events. In fact, we're running a lot of online seminars at the moment, as is everybody. So if people want to attend any of those, please do. We would love love to have um, anyone from the group here. 
and just just to say, Jen, you got a three letter Twitter handle. My envy, serious envy, Jar. Just it's just about an early being an early adopter. But thank I you. Know, I know. Um, well, um, for, we are out of time, um, and I need to wrap things up. But I want to thank all of you for great questions. Uh, really, really great comments. Um, as always, I really learned a lot. I'm really delighted that you were able to share so much. Uh, I think we have questions left over and some comments. Uh, I'd like to uh, share some of them in a blog post to come. Um, and in the meantime, again, let me thank uh, let me thank Jen and let me thank uh, Jen. And just quickly point out where things are going in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, remember that we have a whole series of great topics coming up. Uh, everything from mentoring, professional development to trauma informed teaching. Uh, how to spark exciting conversations about educational technology as well as improving equity uh, for black students if you'd like to keep talking about all these issues everything from mobility to what happens to universal design for learning just please on twitter use the hashtag ftde and we can keep rolling with that if you'd like to dive back into the past into some of our sessions where we've talked about academic labor and of course about teaching with technology, just head to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive and you can see about 260 recordings right there. And that's all for today's session. Thank you all for a great, great conversation. Uh, please keep it all coming. Uh, everyone, good luck with this summer. Good luck planning for this fall and uh, stay safe. We'll see you online. Bye-bye.